wonderful Laura Rathbone. She is fascinated and dedicated to sharing the science and philosophy of pain with the aim of supporting more clinicians to work with an evidence-based whole person approach when supporting people experiencing pain. She is a qualified physiotherapist and completed her musculoskeletal in advance, or her Master of Science, sorry, in Advanced Neuromusculoskeletal Physiotherapy at King's College London, where she explored the philosophy and complexity of pain. Laura worked across multiple musculoskeletal settings before joining a specialist tertiary pain management unit in one of the UK's top hospitals. She now supports people with pain and clinicians working with pain from all over the world, teaches courses on integrated approaches to MSK therapy, and guest lectures at universities in the UK and the Netherlands. She qualified as a journalist before studying physiotherapy, where she deeply um, became deeply interested in language, communication, and society. Laura brings this interest in these skills to her work to produce a podcast called Philosophers Chatting with Clinicians and founded the international reading community Pain Geeks. So please welcome Laura. There's nothing like coming into contact with your own ego when someone reads your bio out to you. It's like, oh, God. Okay. Um, so... This topic I picked, and um, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand, so I'm going to try my best to try and help people that have never heard of philosophy get an introduction, uh, phenomenology get an introduction to it, people that have heard of it get a little bit of clarity, um, and people that know it really, really well give them an opportunity to correct all of the errors that I make speaking about it. So, um, uh, But I thought it might be a bit of an opportunity for us to start with something a bit weird. Um, so the, the invitation is to notice any urges to act that might come up. And the permission is to act as fully within those urges as you feel you can today. Right? And uh, people at home, you can do this too. So I'm going to just have to fiddle around with the uh, tech. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now you all understand, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's probably going to get weirder. Um, but whilst you were doing that, what, just take a moment now within yourselves just to reflect on what you noticed happening. Did you notice any urges to move, any opportunities to engage with it that you you took on purpose, maybe? Did anybody sing in their mouths, like your tongues were doing the singing? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? And I suppose the question that I, I mean, this is what I love. I just love experience. Like, how do we do that? How does that happen? Because I'm pretty sure you didn't walk into this room thinking, I know what we're going to do. We're going to have some malamala, do do. So, so something about the environment, something about the change in the environment offered up this new way of being in this room. And you showed up to that opportunity and engaged in it. And for me, that is just fascinating. Because why? Like, how? How does this happen? And this is a joyful experience. But experiences can be anything and everything. They can be as, as wide of an experience as you can fathom as, a as, as you who have lived on this planet 
in your world for as long as you have gaining experiences about what you can experience. So, yeah. So this is, this is where I am in my journey. And I'd say I'm sort of in the beginning of the middle phase of my clinical career, which tells you a little bit about how old I am, which I am proud. Um, but I'm really at the very beginning of trying to understand philosophy because I was not exposed to philosophy coming from a working class town in the northwest of England because that was only for, you know, idiots. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> right. So this might feel like a bit of a rabbit hole to dive down, and it is. And it's a very deep rabbit hole. And we're only going to put our paw into it. So if anything that you see here, anything that you hear here, any words that you think, ooh, what's that? Write it down and then go and look it up. And if you're still not sure, we can talk about it and I might not be able to answer it, so I'll help you find someone who can. But this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. And so keep this in your mind and keep thinking about where you can go next with it. And remember, I'm a clinician, not a philosopher. So I am sitting here with huge imposter syndrome because this is not my speciality, this is not my topic. This is just something I feel really interested in and I think it can really help us when we're dealing with complexity in the clinic. And also, just to build off some of the great talks that we've had over this weekend, thinking about power, our own experience of those power relationships and how that might intrude on the therapeutic relationship, about this need for uh, certainty, about this, this clinical goal of supporting people to find success. Why do we do all of that? Why is that important? Why do we think words matter? And I think that if we look at some of our philosophy and we go a little bit deeper underneath our body of knowledge, we start to find some really interesting um, information and theories that we might not have really been aware of before. So I've already told you I'm pretty interested in experience. And I'm really interested in the experience of pain. And I think I'm interested in the experience of pain because I grew up looking at pain all the time. My mum had chronic pain, and so I was that kid, you know, the kid of the mum that comes into your clinic that sat in the room while she's having a treatment or she's trying again to get rid of her back pain but still got it. I was the kid, I was that kid of the mum who sometimes spent a day in bed or couldn't do the kind of things that other mums could do. And I think the reason I'm interested in pain and particularly pain care justice, this idea of making sure people get access to valuable care and compassionate care, and that when they meet their clinician, the clinician is fucking interested in them. Because that's my mum. And it's yours, and it's ours, right? They are, our, they are us, patients are us, we are patients, they're our family. So, experience, what do we know about it? There's only really one certainty in that it is subjective. And it's known only to the experiencer. And this is an important thing, because if it's not known to the, if it's known to somebody other than the experiencer, what does that allow space for? Doubt, yeah? And human beings, and I'm really only gonna talk about humans, but you could think about all biological uh, intelligent beings, we have developed to become highly complex. But that doesn't mean that what we're doing is very complicated. So if you all go and look up single cell amoebas hunting, you'll start to see these very simple organisms displaying intelligent activities, exploring their environment, looking for food, excreting waste products, and just generally poddling about, well, not amoeba because they're quite slow, but you can go and you can see this kind of like behavior, this kind of intelligent behavior, but not consciousness. The thing about consciousness is that it really only exists in complex organisms like people and other mammal and other uh, um, sentient beings. And we do this because we have this, this highly complex system that's using multiple systems in order to um, 
maintain flexibility with uh, stability within a flexible environment, and that's on the internal state and the external state. And that's really what is um, important about how human beings navigate the world. The other thing that I thought was really interesting when I started looking into this is that this term self-evidencing. So self-evidencing is this phenomena of going about the world, finding out information about yourself within the world and proving that you are alive in the world. And philosophers use a lot of really technical jargon, which is still a struggle. Um, but essentially, we're going around collecting this information, and this is stored as a priori knowledge. It's something that we don't need. We don't need experience, further experience, in order to understand. We then go out into the world, we generate new information from experiences, and that then comes in and updates that a priori knowledge for the next experience. So we're continuously updating, constantly sampling. We're sampling it within this internal state. We're sampling within the external state. And between that dynamical coupling between what's happening on the inside and what's happening on the outside is how we understand ourselves within the world. I think. <laughs> I think that's what they're saying. So there's a couple of ways that we can try to make sense of this and try to theorize this. And of course, the most uh, famous way is uh, Cartesian dualism or substance dualism. I just want to put the time frame on this. So this is Rene Descartes. In 15, born in 1596 and died in 1650, publishing around 1630s and beyond. And he is trying to understand how human beings have this thing called a conscious experience. And what's really groundbreaking about this work is that he starts to couple the nervous system with this. Now, to Descartes, living within sort of like Renaissance France. Um, I don't know, I wasn't there, but like it was a pretty a pretty unusual place, and we probably wouldn't recognize culture if we were to just magically jump back. This was a time when, you know, the church not only owned the soul, which was situated within the body, so it was a crime against the church, it was a crime against the state. It was a crime against the person to cut into the body, right? So we didn't have access to the anatomy that we do now. And to speak out against that position was a crime, was heresy. And here we have a man saying, well, hang on a minute. How do I know I can trust what I see and feel and taste in the world? What do I know to be true? And this is the sort of premise of a metaphysical approach. What is true about the nature of the world that I'm in? And he employed a methodology called radical doubt. And I think it's really important that we understand and know that doubt is a part of this methodology. Let's say I can't trust any of the information that's coming in. So I don't know if any of this is real or true. I could be dreaming. There could be a demon putting thoughts into my mind and giving me the idea that this is true. There could be something broken inside of me giving me bad information. I could be mistaken. So how do I, how do I know I am real? And the only thing that Descartes could be sure about, because the method of, of, of uh, radical doubt is doubt everything and everything and everything and everything until you find the thing that you're like, there's rock bottom. OK, I'm sure of that. That's absolutely true. It has to be true. Now, you might recognize that in some of the ways that we do clinical practice or, or biomedical science. We doubt everything and everything until we find something that's true. And then that's the cause. Yeah, well, that's the variable. That's the causally relevant variable. So the only thing I know to be true is that I must be somehow thinking because I'm going through this process. I think, therefore I am. Yeah? 
So to Descartes, there were two substances. There was this body substance, which was corporeal, and then this immortal, ethereal, godlike substance that, that, that was stimulated through our nervous system. And then the, <laughs> the door opened in the pineal gland, and shoom, down it came. And there we go. I've got this lovely experience. And that's perfect, because that's God-given. This is flawed because it is physical, it is matter, it's untrustworthy. Okay, we moved on a bit from then because Descartes' work was very influential and sparked all of the great like, uh, technological advances in medicine that we've had. But the, the dualism moved on a little bit and it moved into a more materialist place. And this was um, a person called, well, Locke is associated with this, okay? Um, and he said, no, 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 there's not two materials, there's two properties. So now we've got the same material somehow doing two different things. One is an unthinking property, so a non-conscious material, uh, one, a non-conscious property, biological mechanisms, and one is a conscious property that is of the same material but is, not there, but is somehow separate to it. So the information is coming in through the non-conscious stuff, and then we get this conscious experience, which we call the mind, and that's been situated in the brain for a very long time. Right. What's the problem? So this is known as the hard problem. How do you explain, so if we're going to appeal to property dualism, how do you explain how unconscious matter gives rise to conscious experience? And if you know, like, just let us know. <laughs> because we don't know. This is the hard problem. Um, and this was a, um, a, a term coined by Dave Chalmers. So I didn't call it the, the easy problem when we we're looking at biological stuff, okay? Um, but the easy problem is explaining mechanisms because this is a controllable science, yeah? But the problem still remains. How does parts like this come together and create consciousness. It's all the same atoms at the, at, the sub, at the molecular level, but how does it create consciousness? This is a problem, and we don't have an answer to that, but we get really stuck with it in the clinic. Well, how, if I've got no pain in my body, where do I have pain come from? Well, then it's in your mind, so what must that be? Well, then it must be your thoughts and your behavior. Well, how does that give me pain in my body? Yeah. So we've, we have this struggle of trying to explain an unsolved philosophical problem in the clinic. And then we get really flustered. And it's not a surprise, is it? Because we've got no philosophical architecture to, dis to explain this. So what do we do? She asked. <laughs> Phenomenology! Phenomena. Do, 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 do. OK, so this is just, phenomenology does not say that they can answer that problem. <laughs> OK, we can use a phenomenological approach to find a way to live with the unease that we can't answer the hard problem. And more recently, phenomenology, ph phenomenologists are using, um, are using embodied cognition and predictive processing, and the worlds are coming together, and we're starting to move the conversation a little bit further forwards around, well, how does consciousness happen? But we're, we're not there, and I'm certainly not doing any of this work, so I'm definitely not there. But, Phenomenology is interesting because it is an ontology, so it tells us something about what it is to be in the world. Well, that's important to us as clinicians because that's the level that we're working on, that conscious level. 
It's an epistemology, so it tells us something about how people might be getting information about the world. So that gives us something to work with. And there's a methodology. It, uh, it, it sets out a way for us to tolerate the discomfort of not having all the answers so that we can sit in the uncertainty. Now, as we go through the next few slides, I 100% guarantee you're going to see yourself in them. You're going to be like, I'm doing that. Or you might be like, oh, that's, acting, that's acceptance and commitment therapy. Or, oh, that's gestalt therapy. Or you're going to see this because it is a philosophy that is underpinning cultural ways of understanding the world. Yeah? It's just a different philosophy to biomedicalism and dualism. So knowing the difference between the two will help you navigate that conflict we have in the clinic. I think. Well, it helped me. So this is a client I've been working with for two and a half years. And she has given me permission to share her art. She's a photographer. And she's, she asks regularly, but I don't look like I'm in pain. But yet I am in pain. And people don't believe me because I don't look like I'm in pain. I have to fight for people to believe me. Because typically, as dualistically culturized people, we come from a position of doubt. Because that's the method. That's the culture. A phenomenological approach would say, there is no appearance reality distinction. How you say it is for you is exactly how it is. So we come from a position of belief. Because I can't know what it is to be you. So the only thing I know is that you must know what it is to be you. Therefore, your data is more reliable than mine. The world appears as it is and is as it appears. This this relationship with the world, there is no space for, de for a, um, a kind of a communicative error. It is as it appears. And so we, do this, we, we talk about this thing called embodied cognition. So embodied cognition is an empirical approach to understanding consciousness. It's a phenomenological approach, so we, take, we prioritize the first-person experience. It rejects property dualism. It says there's not two properties. There's no, the, the, my body is not a conduit of information of, for the mental bit to just appear, to just give us consciousness and experiences. It says, I am embodied, embedded, and inactive within the world. I, the bits that are in me, are in direct conversation with the world around me. The world shows up. There is real stuff. So it acknowledges that there is an, a subject independence reality. So there is real stuff over there that will go on even if I'm not there. So there's real stuff, and then there is me, a subjective being. The real stuff in the world shows up, and intrinsic within that real stuff, there are ways for it to be interacted with, affordances. I show up, see the real stuff, and acknowledge the affordances, and then use my prior knowledge to in interact with it. And so I'm bringing my prior knowledge of who I am in the world and how I explore the world to every worldly interaction. Oh, I better hurry up. <laughs> are, we going, are we going all right so far? Yeah? OK, good. So <laughs> philosophers love a chair example. The chair. <laughs> OK. Chairs and squares, they do. <laughs> OK, <laughs> right. And you can do this along for yourself if you want. So if you feel able to, and it doesn't have to be a chair, no, you might not be on a chair. So if you feel able to, sort of stand up and just look at your chair. 
And if you don't feel like standing, perhaps look at somebody else's chair. Or if you're not in a chair, look at your bed. And as you're looking at it, know that movement affords communication. So that little ripple of human connection and interaction was offered up to you. So you're welcome. <laughs> right. So I want you to think, what do I already know about the chair? And ask yourself in authenticity. Look at it. Interact. What do you already know about it? What do you know about the chair? Just run that through in your mind a little bit. What do you know about it? At what point is it not a chair? How do you know it's a chair? <laughs> I told you it'd get weird. <laughs> what makes it a chair? What if it looked different? Would it still be a chair? What is intrinsic to the object that gives it chairness? You can sit on it. There we go, we've got that intentional interaction, right? The world doesn't just exist, it exists relative to me, it's subjective to my experience because I experience the world, yeah? Okay, what do you know about your ability to interact with it? And I invite you to play with that. How can you interact with it? What do you know about it? <laughs> you're definitely uh, philosophers. You're like, I can do it all in my mind. I don't need to touch this. I am like Descartes. I can just rationalize this. <laughs> touch it, feel it, interact with it. You have permission. You've just been sat on it. It was part of you a minute ago. You didn't even know you were on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I want you to ask yourself this question. What would it be like if all of a sudden you couldn't interact with it? If all of a sudden you could not have that relationship, you couldn't fulfill that call to action by your environment? It would be jarring. It would be jarring. It's interesting, yeah. Thank you, you can sit down. I want you to bring this knowledge with you. So these are my kids. They love a forest. We call this the landscape of affordances. So the real world shows up and offers me opportunities for action. And I show up with my capacity to act. And we have this symbiotic relationship. Yeah. I am 38 in a few weeks. So I have 38 years worth of prior knowledge. Does that make me more flexible or less flexible? Mm. Right? My kids have six years and four years of prior knowledge. Does that make them more flexible or less flexible? More. So they are more flexible as in they are more inaccurate at knowing what those affordances are and how they can interact with it. So what do they do? They play with it. They try and figure it out, you know? Right? They're testing out what are the affordances of this, of this material and what does it bring me when I do it? Yeah? Do I get this a feeling of attunement? Like, yeah, I, I, was able to enact, I was able to act with this in the way it offered it up to me and it felt good and I was able to achieve my goal of pushing my chair into the table or whatever it is they're doing. Yeah? Does, it, does it do... Do we have this nice in interactive relationship? Or does it not work? Did I fall off? Why did I fall off? Then they go through that process of trying to figure it out. 
So they're becoming more and more and more precise, yeah? More and more better at interacting with chairs based upon their prior knowledge. Where do we get prior knowledge from as we, as we grow up? Culture, society. If the child falls over, this is, goes back to some of Melanie Knowles' work and the immediate caregiver. What do they, they are part of the landscape of affordances. They are affording the child an experience. You fall over, <gasps> oh my God, that's really bad. Yeah, We're, we are now directly ooh, interacting with. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just unpick that for a moment? <laughs> But we're, we're directly, um, you know, we don't live in a bubble. And, and I just direct you to this paper if you are interested in this work. Um, but we don't live in a bubble. You know, we, we are, our landscape of affordance is rich because our ability to experience is rich. So symbols, language, art, nature, each other my own memories, because my thinking world is a narrative world. Words are symbolic. Symbols can hold an affordance. Money means a lot to us right now, but imagine if we were a population that just landed on Earth and had never seen money before. Would it mean anything to us? So that, that opportunity for action is agreed upon by a community which means communities can change them when they don't serve communities anymore. Great, hey? So this is Frida Kahlo's broken col column on show in Mexico City. And if you do ever get to see it, do. Um, but I want you to just notice how you feel when you look at it. Communication is not only with words. Nonverbal communication is also a part of our capacity to act and interact and update. So allowing, interacting with art allows us to feel. Inter, acknowledging and reading a person's nonverbal communication, whatever that is, allows us to feel along. And this work by uh, Peter Stilwell and uh, Catherine Harmon, it was, it's just beautiful. So it takes the biopsychosocial model, which really is coming from that property dualistic perspective, which is why it doesn't work. It's why we get lost in it, because we're getting caught up in trying to explain how does this property talk to this property, talk to this property. Yeah, we're trying to explain an unsolved philosophical problem that goes back to the Greeks, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but, you know, my ability, my understanding of my lived world with my living body is now coming into interaction with your understanding of your lived world and your lived body. And hey, look at this together. We're creating a lived world between us that is now within the lived world. And we've got meaning, shared meaning and connection. And that might feel really great, because we've got this lovely attuned connection. It's positively valence, and we're like, yeah. It might feel really awful, where you're just like, oh, that clangs. Don't know. Nope. Doesn't feel right. Mm, don't. Not engaging. And that changes how we feel about each other. It changes how we feel about the words that that person says. It changes how much we're going to attend. Yeah. These models can help us. Attunement, disattunement, yeah. Okay, so without trying to solve, fix, or explain pain, because I know you're all very good at it, what do you already know about pain? Without having to appeal to models or frameworks or biology, what do you know from your experiences about pain? Feel free to shout it out if you feel open to it. Hmm? Distressing. Distressing. I can't see because it's all ma masks, so you can't see. Just motivating. motivating. Okay. Isolating. Isolating. It's, an it's an experience. Yeah. Personal. Scary. It's 
scary. Part of life, Part of life yeah. So we have that kind of like ref, uh, post, like that kind of reflective phase. This this is meaningful in this way. Yeah, all of these things are reflective. Yeah. So you already know this. So we shouldn't be surprised when other people also know it and they come into our room and they go, this is really scary, I'm really distressed, I'm really frightened. What can we do? Yeah, I know. I know because I know pain too. Before all of that biology and anatomy told you you didn't know anything about it, something that you'd been doing all your life. Yeah. Without filtering yourself, what do you already know about how it is to be in pain? What changes in your life world? Right, it's exhausting. What happens to it? Does it get bigger? It gets smaller. We already know what it feels like, what it is. Yeah? So, we can believe people when they already know. And when you're having pain, aside from reducing it, so let's just see if we can park that. I know it's uncomfortable, I know we don't want to, but let's just put that to one side. What could you, or we, change about how you are doing things in the world that would change your experience of pain? What do you already know? Yeah? You can listen, yeah? Okay. But what can you do? Yeah, listening is good. For your, for your own pain? Yeah, okay, you can listen to your body. Yeah, nice. Accept it. You can accept it. You can be like, yep, okay, it's here. I can park it. Yeah? Stop catastrophizing pain. Okay, so give me that in a non-clinic language. So, what can you do or change, yeah? Right, I can offer up myself a reassuring opportunity, yeah? I can start talking to myself in words that might reassure myself, and you know which words they are, because they're yours, right? <laughs> we might try moving differently, we might do something. We might change the weight. We might think about some different coping strategies in terms of thoughts, yeah? We've got lots of different avenues to interact upon this. And if it changes, great. And this is what we call the phenomenological, uh, phenomenological interviewing. That's the phenomenological reductionism. Yeah. So this is the methodology. I'm going to know all the things that I know about it. And then I'm going to just put it over there. And we call that bracketing. So I can't really necessarily change that. And that might change how I know about it in the moment. I'm just going to put that over there, and then I'm going to open myself up to exploring it here in the moment right now. And that might be an object, so we might do that together, or it might be another person's experience. I'm going to sit here and listen, because I know all of this stuff about my pain and about some sort of fancy pain science and words, but I don't know anything about yours. Yeah? Oh, sh sugar. Okay, and sometimes it changes, which is great, but sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't, we might try to pull away, and there's some finger traps on your tables for you to have a little feel of that. You might try to pull away and get away from it. That makes sense, because it is negatively valenced. It's leading to a kind of disattuned state, and we're like, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. But here's the problem. It's gonna wake up with you in the morning. It's going to be with you as you brush your teeth. It's going to be with you for the rest of the day. It might be with you for the next few months. It might be with you for the next few years. Pulling away might not be the most helpful solution. So then what do we do? And then we arrive at this place where, OK, maybe I need to find a new way of being with this. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. Because now we're talking about who am I in the world? 
to move towards a new way of being, I have to be able to acknowledge there is a non-being now, a not allowed to be, yeah? Can't be. So as therapists working in pain, we know this. So we shouldn't expect people to get better quickly because now we've got to start building up prior knowledge of who I am in the world with this thing that I really don't like and that hurts me and has taken so much from me. So we have to be able to facilitate support and love this grief process alongside an exploratory process, which is done in absolute good faith, with absolute authenticity. And we might employ all the same stuff that we normally do, graded exposure, novelty, play, values-based goals. Nothing changes, but how we do it changes because it's not about me or my stuff. I need to bracket that. It's about this person, well, how is that for you? And we walk alongside, and what does that feel like? Do you think you can go, yeah, I can do this. Okay, no, I'm, okay, well, that's fine. We come here, we try again, we do this. You're dancing with your patient supporting them to start building up successful, positively valenced prior knowledge of the world that will lead into this pre, uh, more successful, more precise prediction of the world so that they can find new ways to navigate, new ways to be. And it's not, it's not, the, it's not the miracle ending but it's, the, it's, it's still a way of being. It's still a way of moving forwards. And it's really hard. And we cannot do this in the system as it is currently designed. Or if we, we have to allow more flexibility, we have to have more support for the clinicians because this is not only distressing for the patient, but it is emotionally loading for the human being that is loving that person along that way. So right now, many of you are at the same stage as me in my career, and you might be supervisors and managers. And I think it's really important that we have this conversation about how are we providing safe spaces for the clinicians that we work with to do the necessary work of supporting people towards a new way of being with a thing that has taken so much in an authentic, genuinely loving way. And when we think phenomenologically and from an embodied cognit cognitive, blah, 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 it doesn't matter how many years you, still, you look at it, you still can't say the words. We're not just thinking about what's happening on the inside of the person, which mechanisms, and then how does this thing happen? Remember, we've already rejected that. We're thinking about that person's lived world, which moves with them, by the way. So when they come into the clinic, it's not your clinic anymore. It's their lived world, and you're just in it. You are, one of, you are part of their field of affordances. So allowing people the flexibility to move things around in your clinic, change things, change the lighting, put some music on if they need it. Yeah, allow the person and you to collaborate to create the optimal environment for successful updating. And we're trying to capture this moment, this experiential information in the moment because that is when it is at its truest. Now you might recognize that from mindfulness, yes, because phenomenological, phenomenology was not invented by some white German dude in the, middle, in the middle of the Renaissance period. Phenomenology has been happening for generations and generations before. It is the study of experience. So when we experience something and we try to attend to that in the moment, that is a phenomenological approach. But it might be called something different. Yeah, and new patients might call it something different. And we should, we should respect that and honor that. We don't change that language. It's not our language, not our affordance, their affordance, their opportunity, their lived world, their lived body. Yeah. 
we just walk alongside it and try to be as respectful as we can. Phenomenology is just a language that was invented by somebody called Husserl to help us have a shared architecture for this experience and this way of exploring this experience. That's all. Could be called lots of different things. I'm sharing this because it's a, a, a client of mine that I've been working with for about a year now. And she's got uh, a trauma background, which I won't share, but she also has a chronic neck pain. And she found it really hard to express herself with words and like nonverbal communication in her body. That wasn't working for her. She couldn't do that. So she wanted to do it through paint, so we were I was happy for that. However, the, however people want to communicate is absolutely fine. And she wrote a reflective piece after the first, the first time that the, the canvas spoke to her. So the way we set it up was, just put it in your room. Don't do anything with it. Go about your day. You'll know when it's speaking to you for something, and you'll know when you're showing up to that call to action. And she did, and this is what she wrote. I tried to be perfect, so I did a painting of the dropped ice cream onto a floor that would rarely exist but a vertical, but a vertical background of varying emotions, like doors to go through. The joy in the painting is that my favorite flavored ice cream has made has been made with real strawberries in it. And the red lines on the floor, in retrospect, represent anger and resentment. So something about how she was using her body and how that opportunity to paint was doing something meaningful for her, and it helped her to express something like anger, which she hadn't done up until that point. And then she goes on, and this is after a few times. So the, the process is, OK, and go back to it, and keep adding to it, and change it. Do what feels right over the next few weeks. And then she did a reflective piece on that. Sometimes, and I'm just dropping down into the third paragraph, but do, re do read it through. But sometimes the new painting is an attempt to fix or change the old one. The hypocritical me wanting to keep things contained and controlled. Yeah, so that inflexibility. I don't want to move. I don't want to change. I don't want to do this thing. It's how I operate or used to. Something shifted. Don't know what it is. Can't measure it. Can't put it on a scale. But something's shifted in the world. And she's more open to doing things differently. I just think that's really cool that that can happen. And you might be a physical therapist or a physiotherapist or an OT, and I know OTs are already doing this work because they're amazing. And, um, or you might be a psychologist. It doesn't really matter. None of that stuff. It's all made up stuff that we just agreed to keep doing. And if you don't agree with it, we just unmake it, right? And I think there's a point in our career where we're like, OK, in the beginning, I identify with my profession and the professional culture and norms, right? And what everybody else thinks my profession is. And then within that, you find the bit that you really like. And then you start identifying with that. That fills you up a bit. That, off that affords you a more meaningful way of interacting or acting in your profession. That's OK. It doesn't make you less of a whatever, just makes you really interested in being a whatever that's interested in this. Yeah. I think that's really cool. So I know everybody wants to know where to start with this stuff. So I'm going to put up a few slides. If you're, if you're picturing slides for references, get ready. Because this is how I operate, so I'm guessing it's, it's what I already know. OK, is everybody OK? Can I go to the next one? This is a brilliant paper. This is about clinical work with an active lens. Ready? Obviously, I've got to have Julian Kiverstein, Mick Thacker, and the Michael Kirchhoff paper. This is beautiful. It's heavy. Don't expect to understand it the first time. Read it. Don't understand it. Put it to one side. Think, what was that? Read it again. Yeah? 
These are some books that will help you start to um, understand a bit more of the language and be able to interact a bit more with the language. And I can't really end this without saying a huge thank you to the philosophers and the clinicians that have joined me on my podcast. There are more ready to be published and there's more in the planning. So everybody can join up to watch them for free. You just sign up to the event, you can be in the audience, you can ask questions. Uh, this is something that, sh that we should be able to access because some of us have never ever been able to access philosophy before. And I have to say a huge thank you to Julian, Kivistine, and Mick Thacker, who have really just given so much time to these conversations. And I only hope that I have honored those conversations and done them justice and apologize for any errors, which I'm sure I'll be told about. <laughs> I hope to be. Um, and the great news is you don't need any specialist training in this. You've already been doing it all your life. But you might need to intentionally pr uh, contemplate and develop and nurture a practice. But don't forget to dare to know what you already know, because it is valuable. Thank you. glad it's over. It's hard going last because you just spend the whole weekend watching everybody else's amazing talk thinking, oh my god, mine's going to be rubbish now. Everybody else's is so useful and mine's just abstract philosophy, but okay. <laughs> Not really. Does anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? <laughs> Anything online? They've all gone to sleep. Every, well, I'm, I'm thinking everyone's Googling those articles and also some of the words you used. Um, okay. Hi, Mac. Hi. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say uh, that end comment right there I know was a joke, but the rationalism of Western thought that um, literally uh, discredits the humanities has dehumanized our culture. Yeah. And it and again, I am not, you know, uh, slamming you. I'm simply okay. saying, you know, that all of us who care about treating people and, and trying to help people live better lives, yeah. the humanities, as you demonstrated, have been exploring this yeah. for centuries. Yeah. And there is knowledge there that is directly useful to all clinicians who care about the people in their care. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more, could not agree more. And I think that's absolutely right. The humanities have slowly been edged out of, well, definitely medical training and clinical training. And I think that we as a community and as a society really need to look at that from an ethical perspective because the, the tendency to reduce complex phenomena down to mechanism is exactly that. It is a denial of the humanity of the people that we are, we are working with, the people that we are, and the community around us. And we have to fight for the humanities, you know, because every uh, power institution and power state starts to reduce the creative freedom of its people for a reason. They don't want you flexible. Well, they, who's they? I don't know. It, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's really important that we resist that and we don't allow it because the humanities allow us, they afford us the opportunity to feel into the, the work that we do, the people we are, the people we work with, the people we don't know anything about, it allows us to connect from across cultures, across generations, across time zones, across geography, yeah? This is not a small, frivolous bit. Medical humanities is absolutely essential. And if you haven't done any of it, you have a huge gap in your clinical skill set that you need to fill.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, multiple times this weekend, you've brought up the fact that the way the system is set up doesn't really support clinicians in doing this type of work, and I agree with you. I left my outpatient orthopedic practice so that I could treat clients the way I know is best. So I want to ask you that same question. What do you think we need to do for clinicians to be supported to be able to really serve these populations and everyone? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. Um, this is a soapbox I love. Um, right, so first of all, I don't have the answer, actually. I, d I don't know. I think that there is probably a solution that isn't going to come from one person. You know? There's a solution. I haven't even thought, I haven't, I haven't got the capacity to have that level of emotion that is massive system overhaul. Yeah, we're not going to do that alone. I know it's not right. I know it's not working. I know that, right? And I know that between us, we have the capacity to find a new way of doing things. And we're also intelligent, compassionate people, so we can try things and we can also flexibly respond when it doesn't quite work. I think we have to address capitalism. We have to address the social structures of power, like colonialism and racism, all the things that have been brought up over this weekend that I am not qualified to speak on, but I am definitely like, qualified to be pissed about it and to be ready to do the work and help and be part of any change. What can I do? That's something that I've been working on for the last few years. So I think clinicians need more safe spaces for support and coaching and supervision. I think supervision isn't about, do you know this, do you not know this? Supervision spaces are somewhere between therapy, because our job is really fucking hard, right? It is hard. It's hard to be a person living with pain. It's also hard to be a, patient, a clinician doing that in an unsupported way. And we need support systems for both that are compassionate and appropriate and collaboratively made for both populations, although we're the same population because actually clinicians are patients and patients are clinicians. But anyway, that was a... But, um, so what can I do is I think I can help people find some support. So I offer support and I offer it across multiple platforms. So you can come to Pain Geeks, which is affordable, and you can do it for free. If you can't afford it, you send us an email, we'll give it you for free, no problem, just let us know. You can pay towards the running of the community, which, well, we love, because it helps, <laughs> you know. You can be involved in the community, you can practice your writing skills, we will copy edit for you, we will support you to write about things you want, we will promote your voice, it's a platform, it's a family, it's a support system. I also provide more specific to, say, allied health therapist supervision and support. So clinical coaching, you can work with me one-to-one. -one. You can come on my integration subscription where we have two clinical drop-ins a month for support and also peer support spaces. This is what I can do. And if you want to do one of those things and you're like, hey, I don't have enough money for this, I come from a marginalized group, and particularly I will, will preference marginalized, people from marginalized groups, um, write me an email and we'll do it for whatever you can, or if you can't, that's, can't pay anything, that's also fine. Because the most important thing to me is that good clinicians stay in practice if they want to, and that they feel supported to do that. Because that's hundreds and thousands of people in pain a year. So that's what I can do but I don't know the answer to the rest. <sighs> um, one of the things that I thought was interesting was um, the, the uh, discussion of uh, the ideas of Rene Descartes. And um, I, I mean, he was known as, as a mathematician and so forth, not just a philosopher. Right. Uh, and years ago, I read his Meditations on First Philosophy, which was really what set off his, the Cart Cartesian duality yeah. and so forth, and I think, therefore, I am and so forth. But I read the foreword mm -hmm. and the notes pro that, that come before the, the main body of the text, yeah. and, it and it very clearly stated that he was commissioned to write that by a branch of the church. Right. And so there, and it was common back in those days 
for people to be commissioned to, to, to develop works, partly is that was one of the few ways that some people could afford to spend the time yeah. to do things. Yeah. On the other hand, some, a lot of times their patrons had a significant say in like, here's what you're gonna write about or here's some of the elements we want you to include in there. Yeah. And um, some of the key ideas in Meditations on First Philosophy were previously voiced by a Spanish nun whose name I can't recall at the moment. And so, um, you know, we already know that some of his ideas about pain and so forth were dead wrong. Um, yeah. But it just kind of, but, but, I've, but ever since I, I, I read the foreword, even though I, I read the whole thing, I've, I've always kind of felt like, you know, some, some, some doubt about, you know, am I, what am I, when I'm reading, am I actually reading his genuine thinking or am I just reading what he was paid to write? I think that's lovely. Sorry, did I interrupt you? I got no. excited. That's it. <laughs> no, thank you for that because I think this is really important. And if anyone's interested, there's a Pan Psychast episode. I don't know if you've listened to the Pan Psychast podcast. It's a really lovely podcast, um, and there's a, there's a couple of episodes exploring Descartes' theory and, like, you know, did he really believe what he was writing, or was he sort of, was he just placating the church at the time? I don't know. I wasn't there, and I'm not qualified to have that argument, but they are, and it's on, the, and you can go and listen to it, and I'd love to hear what you think, but, yeah, thank you for that, because it's a really important perspective, totally. Thanks. I'm going to finish up with Dr. Hilton. <laughs> Sandy, Chicago. Um, hi. Um, you had asked me that you if you said you? something brilliant this morning, and you didn't mention it in the talk to ask you, um, you had a really great analogy about what pain was. Do you remember? <laughs> about, it was a one sentence. Could you remind me? Yeah. <laughs> Laura, think back to before you knew anything about pain, before you did all your classes. Yeah. Right? And what you thought pain was then? No, I can't remember. Sorry, okay. this, is, this is a mixture of anxiety so, and ADD. So Laura, no think idea. back, to, think back to before you were in school and you hadn't had any classes. Do you yeah. remember ever hurting? Yeah. What was pain then? It just hurt. Yeah. Oh, that was it, that was it! <laughs> Before you went to university, before they told you you didn't know anything about pain, what was pain? Because that's what it is. Yeah? That's the, that's the truthful knowledge. It hurts. And it stops me from doing stuff. It's simple, but very complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>